Today I'm working on the front end of the Ford 1920. The uh, problem I'm having is that uh, right here you can see there's a wear spot on the inside of the tire and that's uh, the head of this nut right here. The tire actually is rubbing up against that. You can see there's actually clearance now because I have the weight off the wheel, got it jacked up. But you can see the reason why is because you got a problem here with the front wheel bearing or spindle. So what I'm going to do is first step is I'm going to take the uh, take the the rim and tire off the hub. Well, I just removed that front wheel, and you know I was thinking about how I was going to have to replace these tires because they look so bad, and I just made a uh, nice discovery about these tires. I think these are actually foam filled because uh, I just went to take this one off and boy it weighs a ton. It is way heavier than it needs to be. So I think this is one of these uh, puncture proof tires and it would make sense since they were using this as a uh, highway or roadside mowing tractor more than likely. Uh, so that's kind of nice. That would be really handy when I'm doing brush hogging. Kind of makes me wonder what's in the back tires. <laughs> now it seems kind of obvious they're foam filled. A look at the uh, end of the valve stem and it's completely filled with foam. Or uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but that stuff that they fill tires with. It's almost like a rubber expanding stuff that just fills the whole tire. And I mean, you could run over a railroad spike and your tire won't run flat. Kind of gives for a, uh, probably explains big reason why I had such a bumpy ride going across the field the other day when I uh, was test driving it for the first time. Rear tires have regular valve stems. So I checked those and those are uh, either just air filled or they might have a uh, calcium chloride or something like that in them. Well between these uh, filled tires and these weights on the front there's a lot of weight on this front end so I'm not surprised at all it's uh, taken some beating. So this uh, Actually, it doesn't look like that much play when you wiggle it here. But when you amplify that to the uh, diameter of the tire, it's enough to cause my problems. Okay, so I'll just uh, remove these three little screws here, and that'll uh, expose the, the axle nut. Okay, with the end cap off, it's simply a matter of removing this cotter pin and then this castle nut. Now with the nut off, the whole hub will just slide right off. So the order that the parts come off in is the nut, then there's this large washer here. It's got a raised ridge on the back here that faces in towards the bearing. Then the first roller bearing, the tapered roller bearing. And then on the back side, and here you've got the seal and then behind the seal there's another flat washer and then there's the other bearing so that seal has to be popped out now on the back side of the hub there's this grease seal right here that has to be removed so you can remove the other tapered roller bearing careful prying removes the grease seal. This is supposed to be replaced whenever you do this service, but uh, New Holland dealer wants about 30 bucks a piece for these. So I'm just gonna clean this one up and make sure it doesn't have any tears in it and reuse it. And then you get this washer comes out and then the inner bigger tapered roller bearing. All right, I've cleaned out the uh, hub and uh, just get most of the grease out with a uh, quick bath in uh, water-based solvent and then you want to inspect the races that the bearing actually sits in and they should be smooth as glass and then uh, of course you flip it over you can see this one the larger one a lot easier and it looks pretty good so that's good because if you get any scoring or damage to that race on either one of those two sides or if you see any visible cracks then you've got to replace the hub which is big bucks 
So uh, then I got my seal. This seal is actually in excellent shape, which is good news because again, I didn't want to pay the thirty bucks or so from the uh, New Holland dealer for this seal. But what I always do with these seals when I take them out is I always make a note of the part numbers that I find on them. Uh, this video is probably not going to come out, but I'll just read it to you. This is an NGK seal, which is a very popular manufacturer. And there's a nice part number right on it of A is an Alpha, Q is in Quebec, 2427, E is an Echo. And I'll look that up later and see if I can find a generic cross for that seal. Alright, did an initial cleaning of the uh, other components here and uh, this cover, this end cap here, has a gasket on it. Part of it's on here and part of it's on the hub. The old gasket left to be cleaned off and then uh, a new gasket put on there. And then we got the, uh, the outer bearing. Uh, again, same thing with this. You know, if you order this from New Holland, it's going to be big money. It's worth trying to see if whether or not there's a... Uh, generic bearing or just a bearing that's available because this is an NGK bearing part number HR 30205J as Juliet. Uh, there's still quite a bit of grease in there so I'm going to do a final cleanup on this in my makeshift parts washer which uh, for small parts which is, this is just an old Black & Decker vegetable steamer that the top piece is broke and we we're going to throw it out and I said you know what it's got a good heating element in there so that's what I use this for. And then on the uh, inboard bearing, the larger of the two. That part number is a uh, HR30207J, as in Juliet, and that's an NSK bearing. NSK. These are all bearing manufacturers that uh, I recognize the, the lettering of from when I worked on my Arctic Cat four, four-wheel ATV. cooking my bearings <laughs> not really cooking them uh, you know the important thing to remember here is I'm using a non-toxic non-volatile uh, solvent water-based solvent still not a good idea to breathe the fumes but um, it's either mildly boiling in there there's no part of the bearing that's going to get damaged by that heat they're designed to withstand a lot more heat than that uh, but what it's doing is it's uh, cooking away and getting all of the grease that's inside that bearing out. Well, about five more minutes of this action ought to do it. After I take the bearings out of the solvent bath, I uh, rinse them under water and uh, to get all the solvent off. And then I have to dry them. They have to be perfectly dried. The service manual actually warns against using air to dry the bearings. They don't want you blowing compressed air through the bearings to dry it. So I'm not sure exactly what the reasoning behind that is. Maybe they don't want you driving any grit residue or anything into the bearing. Not sure, but we'll abide by that. So I got an old toaster oven that I use for drying parts like this. So just throw it in there, throw it up to 250 degrees for about 10 or 15 minutes, and uh, it'll be bone dry when they come out. Okay, out of the oven. As soon as they're cool enough to handle, I'll start packing the grease in. Repacking the bearings is exactly as the name implies. You basically want to pack the grease in or push the grease in. So what I do is I don nitrile gloves and I just uh, dig right into my tub of grease and I start working and squeezing and working and pushing the grease in from all sides, from the outside, and then uh, rotate the bearing as you're doing that so that you can make sure that it gets moved around in there and you're getting a little air pockets out and you push through and keep pushing and you'll end up getting the grease pretty well packed. Uh, ideally, you want to use a tool for repacking bearings, which is, I'm sure you may, have, may not have seen them, but they just sit on the bench and you put the bearing on, you put a top cover on, and it's got a Zerk fitting on it and you just pump the grease in and it squeezes the grease from the inside out but uh, don't have one of those, so pack them by hand. Okay, use a small brush to get grease on the inside of the hub here on this uh, inboard side. 
put the inboard bearing in and then I uh, stuck this washer on the back here where it goes and it's going to be kind of like held in place by the glue action or the sticky action of the grease and that's going to help me align it when I go to slide it on. Now I'm going to put the uh, seal back in the back side here. Okay now I've reinstalled the seal and uh, I'm ready to put this on the uh, spindle. Of course the spindle has been all cleaned off and inspected for uh, damage and it looks fine. Uh, I'm going to put a coating of grease on the spindle and then slide this on. I also notice there's a uh, it's a stamp right here. There's some kind of a logo stamped on the inside of the hub here. It's probably the manufacturer of the hub. It's, uh, I'm not familiar with that logo, but it's kind of interesting. Almost ready to reinstall the hub. Uh, things to examine on the hub, you want to look for any serious galling or damage or any clear signs that the spindle's bent. Um, also, you want to check this surface here, which is what the uh, the seal, the inner seal lip rides on for damage. And then the uh, last thing I'm going to do before I put the hub on is I'm going to scrape off the remnants of that old gasket. Okay, hub's in place. Now I'm going to install the outer bearing. Okay, the outer bearing's in place. Now uh, a little bit of grease on this gear. Um, I mean on this big flat washer and then it gets installed with this ridge facing in towards the bearing and then the castle nut. Okay, now the castle nut's installed temporarily. Now the critical part here is how tight to tighten the castle nut. You want to preload the bearing. So what you end up doing is you actually tighten this nut slowly as you rotate the hub and when you first feel the hub starting to drag you then back the castle nut off to the first available slot so you can install the carter pin and that's the proper way to tighten the castle nut uh, axle nut okay so now I'm going to um, install a new carter pin um, cut a new gasket and put a new gasket with the end cap back in place Okay, put a new gasket on and I put a little uh, light film of blue RTV on this sealant. Now I'm going to put the wheel back on and uh, read the owner's manual last night that I just gotten and lo and behold, uh, it says right in the owner's manual, talks about the different um, tire tread widths that are available on this tractor by moving the axles out. Uh, adjusting the axles here and then also it talks about you can reverse the tires to change the width so after I saw that I realized well that might be another reason why the clearance is so tight right here so what I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try changing the uh, wheel around the other way and seeing if that helps and if that does then I'll leave the wheel that way and then when I take this side off to do this bearing I'll I'll switch that one also well Flipping that wheel around certainly seems to have made a difference. I've got the uh, tractor down off the jack, so uh, I can see now I can actually stick my finger in there as as opposed to before where this was actually uh, barely any room between there and, and with the play in the wheel bearings it was actually rubbing up against here depending on how uh, how the geometry was. So flipping the wheel around seems like a good idea. Um, again, it's in the operator's manual. Uh, reasons why you might not want to do that. Well, your valve stems are on the inside now, which, hey, you know, some people prefer it that way. Uh, and then uh, I don't really care because these are foam-filled tires, which, by the way, weigh a ton. So it helps if you've got an extra set of hands to help you lift this, uh, these kind of wheels up. But anyways, um, this one here wasn't as bad as the other side. So, interestingly enough, what I'm noticing now is if you look at this pan, you can see these welds here on this, this part of the rim. As opposed to on the inside, it doesn't look like that at all. So this wheel, oddly enough, is already on with the, with the valve stem correct uh, or pointing inward. 
So what they did was, at some point they had this wheel off and they put it on the wrong way. So now, I got my wheels on the way I want them. I just gotta, I'm gonna end up taking that one off anyways because I'm gonna redo the bearing on this side too. And then uh, my front end work will be done. Well, for now anyways.